Good afternoon. Welcome to Rocks Film 2020. Thank you for joining us for the screening of The Last American Colony. First, we would like to thank the filmmakers for sharing their work. Especially during these times of unrest, we see the importance of telling these stories and sharing them with the world. We're going to start by having the filmmakers introduce themselves and then spend the time talking about their film. This is a webinar format, so if you have questions, please use the Q&A, and if you have a comment, please use the chat function. All right, so we'd like to start with introductions, so who would like to go first? I'll be happy to start, and Nancy, thank you so much. We're glad to be here at the <coughs> Roxbury International Film Festival. Um, my name is Bester Cram, and I'm the producer and co-director of the film and um, began this film many, many years ago. Um, and uh, just delighted to be here with my colleagues. Mike? Yeah, and uh, I'm Mike Majoris. I'm a co-director and editor of The Last American Colony. And uh, again, thanks for uh, making this possible. Um, you know, it's such a weird time, but it's great to be able to have this level of connection. And great to see my fellow filmmakers, which I haven't seen in a while, so thank you. Joe, you uh, got to take yourself off mute. <laughs> Joe, I'm, you. I'm sorry. There you go. There we go. No, I've been using uh, a portal <laughs> for all my Zoom meetings. And so I said, oh my God, I got to, I don't know if you guys have used a portal, but it has an automatic uh, Zoom feature and all sorts. Anyway, my name is Jose Garcia. Uh, and I've had a great, mm -hmm. uh, experience working with these two gentlemen and with Juan. Juan, uh, Juan has become my hero in many ways uh, for what he was willing to put up with and what he was willing, the risks he was able, to, that he was willing to take to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. Anyway, uh, my, my, uh, my best wishes to my uh, co-director, I mean, co-producer and, and our director, who did an excellent job. And we stuck together with this for 10 years. So, Juan? Uh, good evening. I'm Juan Segarra. It's an uh, extreme pleasure to be here. I mean, I, I lived in Boston f for a long time, so it's almost like going back. And, and it's such a pleasure, even if it's just on the screen, to see my my good friend, Cheo, who, who roped me into this project. And... Through him, I, I was able to meet, you know, Bester and Mike are guys that are great guys and just incredibly talented. I, I couldn't believe how they were able to make such a good story, of, uh, such a bad subject and interview. But, you know, kudos to them. And it, it's really great to be here. Wonderful. Great. And I just want to mention that Pam is going to help us with the um, monitoring the chat in the Q&A and help us get the questions to you. So thanks, Pam, for doing that. All right, so we'll start with the first question about how you chose to make this film. Like, how did you choose the subject matter and how did you, um, yeah, just, just talk about those choices. And so whoever would like to start first, you can go ahead and then other people can chime in. Well, I guess I'll start because I, I, I read the story about what, uh, the, the mach Los Macheteros had done. And then I read about Juan's story. So I reached out to Juan and he said to me, well, why don't you send me what you've written, you know, so far. And we had fictionalized everything. My co the, the other person I was working with at the time. And Juan said, is this what you want to do? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm not interested. <laughs> so then I said, all right, uh, what is your favorite restaurant to eat in in Old San Juan? And so I said, I'll see you there in two days. And if you don't like what I have to say, the worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna have a really good meal in a restaurant you like. And that, that was over 10 years ago. And I guess we're, I convinced them the, the meal was good. So, so anyway, and then what happened was, uh, Bester was approaching the story from another direction. And Juan and I went to a reunion of, uh, well, it was a memorial service, actually, for Filiberto. And we intersected there. And then through happenstance and sheer luck, we 
joined forces and that was the best thing that ever happened from my approach. Bester? Yeah, we, um, we met at night uh, right after um, um, some uh, uh, people were playing trumpets in memorial for Filiberto Ojeda Rios, who had been killed a year before on September 25th, 2005. And uh, we had been down there because we had been filming throughout the whole year the upheaval, uh, political upheaval that was going on in Puerto Rico as a result of this uh, assassination uh, in which uh, the FBI brought in more than 200 people to 200 uh, agents to um, try to um, capture or <clears throat> kill Filiberto, who was a fugitive. And the nation was, uh, the uh, nation was unaware of this. Our nation was unaware of it. I was surprised when I was made aware of it and said, how is it that I don't know anything about this? Why, uh, why is this going on and with, uh, within the uh, decision making of Washington DC and uh, we are completely ignorant of it. And uh, essentially what we were down in San Juan trying to uh, understand the upheaval that was going there in terms of the reaction to the killing of Filiberto. And so at this anniversary of the, the memorial of anniversary of one year of his death, um, without knowing it, I met Juan and I met uh, Jose. I actually, Juan was there with his son and I did some filming with his son who uh, had actually had his life saved um, by Filiberto uh, when they were swimming when he was a younger younger man. And it was a touching story. And um, so it was one of the very few stories that I had connected to a man who had been killed, Filiberto. Um, and uh, then later on, I found out through uh, actually, you know, the small community that we all live in, in terms of the filmmaking community here in Boston, that uh, there was this other project going on and that Cheo was a part of that. And so uh, we connected and uh, realized that well, actually the story to be told was one story as a way for us to begin to get at understanding the notion of why we're, why I was so ignorant to life in Puerto Rico. Um, and I then uh, joined forces with uh, a colleague that uh, I've been making films with for 30 years almost, I think right now. We haven't, not quite counting it, but Mike is, uh, is a uh, person that we have done work on so many different uh, subject matter and uh, he became as engaged and provided as much of the material that is in the film that really helps to flesh it out. Yeah so I, I came into the into the project uh, later than everybody else and uh, I, I think one of my first responses was anger um, both at myself and at my education and not knowing uh, this history and so one of the first steps for me was to delve in and really try to get a grasp on the relationship between the mainland U.S. and the island of Puerto Rico. And that involved uh, going through primary documents and 10,000 pages of FBI reports. And uh, I think the more it started, uh, started to understand the global history, uh, the more it became interesting and compelling to really focus on uh, Juan's life. And, and, and put that in relief and look at the uh, decisions that he made uh, living the history as opposed to me just reading the history. Yeah. Well, and Juan, quite, oh. I'm sorry, you go ahead. No, if you want to add something, go ahead. Sure, there, this is detail that I omitted, which is that initially I had a, another partner I was working with and we wrote a treatment which landed on HBO's desk. And I found myself in California at HBO offices and I pitched it and they were very interested. And I have a friend who had produced films at HBO and he said, you're over your head. And he said, you know, uh, you're going to have to nail down some of these rights. So from that meeting, after that meeting, I called uh, a friend of mine. I said, you know, people who know people, do you know how to get a hold, hold of Juan Segarra? And so then that's how that started for me. And then I also called a reporter in Hartford, Connecticut, the Hartford Current, 
who gave me permission to use all of his background details, which is the story I, re I initially read. Uh, so that's how it started for me. Great, thank you. And say again, what was um, the Juan story where you originally got that? Well, from the Hartford Current okay. and uh, a guy named Edmund Mahoney wrote okay. a series of stories that were in the New York Times. And so when I called him, uh, I said, you know, I'm currently pitching the story and I've been using your articles without attribution and, and I forgive me for but I'm using your, your information. And I said, I know this other guy wrote this other story, but I'm calling you. He said, well, all my stories are the best. I said, that's why I'm calling you. So <laughs> anyway, that's how we started, and uh, at least for my part. And then I had, uh, as a, again, the, the, uh, the great fortune to meet with, with, with Bester and, and things great. came together. And these two guys are uh, solid men, solid men. Ten years we were at this, and at one point wow. we were uh, pursuing another angle on this story. And so they all, we had a, a, a lunch and, and what, what, you know, what are we going to do here? We've been working mm -hmm. this for a long time. Are you ready to give up? I said, no. Both of them said, we're not ready to give up. And so here we are. Wow, that's great. And, and Jose, when they say Cheo, uh, they're talking about you. I'm well, guessing. that's my nom de guerre. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and my nom de plume. Thank you. So Juan, <laughs> you want to tell us what made you want to be part of this? What, what convinced you? Well, I'm, I'm here almost um, by accident because th this really is a story originally from Cheryl's point of view, it was going to be about the Wells Fargo robbery. And Victor Herrera is, of course, the principal there, but he wasn't available. And then on the other side of the, of the coin, it's a story about Filiberto, you know, and um, then, of course, Filiberto was killed and also... Uh, a local Puerto Rican documentary maker made a documentary about Filiberto, which was very good, by the way. And, you know, that presented Cheo and, and, and Bester with the situation, well, you know, can we do two uh, documentaries on Filiberto? It really didn't make much sense. So then, uh, you know, they must have talked it over amongst themselves and said, hey, Pablo, guess what? We're going to have to pivot to you. And then they brought in Mike, who's a genius, you know, to flesh the whole thing out and, you know, make a whole story where they get snippets of me interviewing. If you know, look at it, then you see a lot of times I'm talking about Filiberto because that was originally what it's all supposed to be about. And then when they pivoted, you know, they asked me some questions about my participation. Well, to another detail that's important here with respect to Juan is it. Well, as we were pursuing the story, Juan said, I'm going to my 50th high school union at Phillips. I said, you're going to do what? So I <laughs> called the people at Phillips who were very generous and opened the doors for us. And then uh, I have a, a friend who was head of the chair of the English department at Phillips. And he said to me, how did you get them to let you in here? He goes, they don't let anybody <laughs> film here. I said, I don't know. We just got lucky. But, but our thanks to Phillips Academy. So That's great. So one thing I'm curious about, there was, there was, you put so much into this film. You know, there's so much of the history and, you know, as well as, you know, Juan's story and about Filberto. You know, there's so much in there. And I'm curious about how you chose what to include and what to Question. leave out. That would defer to Mike, to Mike on that one. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a mini series in, in 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, a lot in there, and, and the hope is that there's not so much that an audience gives up. But um, it's, you know, it, and, and I think in all of our minds, it was really important again to, uh, you know, you, you, you can't understand individual actions unless you understand the larger history. And I think that that's one of the things that, that came out of the Macheteros is that, uh, you know, on one hand, you're dealing with the logistics of how do you pull an operation off. But on the other hand, you're dealing with this, you know, this larger context, of the, you know, both politically and socially and economically. So I think 
uh, the more that we delved into uh, the inner workings of the organization, uh, as well as the history, the more I think it became incumbent on us to try to incorporate as much of that information as we could get in there and just hope that an audience would go along for the ride. And I think, and, and I think part of the mechanism, um, you know, film is a, a, in some ways a pretty stupid medium in my mind in terms of conveying information, but it's a very sophisticated medium in terms of uh, uh, conveying emotion. And so I think what we hoped to do is to not only just give a, a you know, a, a list and a, and a litany of historical events and a, and a list of what happened in terms of uh, uh, Juan's decisions, but also to give an understanding of um, why one is compelled, why a group of people is compelled, why Puerto Ricans are compelled to do this. So that was, um, that's why so much is in there. And there could have been, you know, another 90 minutes of material, but, uh, you know, you have to make hard decisions. To, to your point, Mike, when I pitched this to HBO, they said, you know, oh, we don't think you have a film here. We think you have a miniseries. I said, yeah. a miniseries we're not ready for. So anyway, but that's, that's the kind of information that we were confronted with. And then uh, opportunities present themselves as you're making a film. And I said at this luncheon where we were trying to decide what we were going to do, we're trying to figure out how we're going to get uh, Phillips to work with us and, uh, and say, you know, how, how do we convince him? And I said, well, it's a redemption story. He, uh, you know, Juan went to school there. He, he grew up in an upper class family, went there and then went to Harvard. And the question is, why does a man do what he does? And, you know, how do, how do we show that? And then he's come full circle. The fact that he's come back to Phillips, which is where he starts his story, his, his quest to find out about his own life. And as I've said in other uh, meetings, in the process of making a film, I discovered my own history. I was born in Puerto Rico, and I grew up in the United States in Massachusetts. So for me, it was very personal, and, and it still is. Right. And Juan, I, I know in the film, it talks about how you, uh, you, what you wrote for your thesis it, uh, and the research that you did. And I'm curious, um, watching the film and seeing what ended up in the film as far as the history goes, what, um, is there anything that you thought, oh, um, I mean, like, did you have any thoughts about like what got included and what got left out as far as what the film has in it? You know. well, I was just so amazed by the, the the product that Mike came up with and that he had actually gone and some of those pages from the congressional record that I'd read, he, when he did the research, he said, I, I said, oh my God, this guy really went back in there or somehow he got it. I was amazed at, at, uh, at that. And for me, um, that was the first bit of independent research I had done in my life. Um, most of my education, even though it was like extremely rigorous and, and, and very good, they, they, they didn't really teach us a whole lot of critical thinking. You know, it was, um, you had to just digest what you were given and be able to play it back the way they wanted, more or less, you know, and you could show some, some signs of, you know, interpreting a little differently, but basically they wanted you to give them back what they'd given you. And, and that was the first opportunity to, to see things, you know, in a way and be able to like, uh, and it changed my, my whole way of thinking about my own history. I mean, like Cheo said, he didn't know his history. I didn't either. I didn't either. Uh, so, but that opened me up a lot to wanting to learn more. It was a, a real eye opener for me. Um, and then the, my, my next research study was on, on why they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Because uh, this one was for one semester and the other one was, was, was for the other semester. And between both of those, they, they changed my way of thinking substantially. And that started to ferment, of course, then going to freshman year at, at Harvard, which was the year of the, the student strike, the first strike ever in, in history and you know, with all of its aftermath. Yeah, so. 
Do you, um, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I wanted to have an opportunity for you all to share anything that you would like to communicate to the people who've been watching the film. Um, like if there's any, anything you'd like to say, um, I have other questions I can ask, but I just wanted to kind of open it up a little bit because maybe there's something that you really want to communicate. Um, so yeah, I just want to give you that opportunity. Well, after a hundred years of, of uh, cultural domination by the United States, we Puerto Ricans still remain Puerto Ricans. We are, you know, we love the United States for some obvious reasons and then some not so good reasons. But anyway, uh, we have remained, we have our own cultural identity, we have our language and we have our music and all that, that portends. Uh, and so the question is, why are we still neither fish nor fowl? Why are we, you know, not allowed to be who we really want to be? Would you talk to that one? I'd rather just answer any question anybody might sure. have, yeah. Okay, I have some more questions for you. Um, what challenges did you face in making this film? <laughs> Money. <laughs> Wait a minute, doesn't Juan have some money left over? <laughs> <laughs> to that point, I, <laughs> uh, people uh, uh, me, go ahead. Uh, let me just, I'll tell you one of the challenges of this film, and it still has yet to be kind of fully realized, is um, you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a story that you, a lot of people are very unfamiliar with, and there's a lot of unfinished business when it comes to uh, understanding the nature of what um, a political confrontation, particularly when it's tinged uh, with violence and or with some form of armed uh, resistance that goes along with it. So the biggest challenge I think was to, you know, recognize that in the process of uh, changing the course of history, there are a lot of different methods, a lot of different strategic decisions that are made, but also a lot of different tactical decisions that are made. And we thought that, you know, one of the one of the needs for the film was to kind of acknowledge the change of thinking that Juan went through regarding this. But also, you know, I, I'm a person from the 60s and, and I, you know, the, the work that was going on in Puerto Rico in terms of resistance, although I was unaware of it, was, non, un, was not unlike resistance that was taking place around the, the world at different times. That kind of resistance, the need for the resistance exists even more so today. Yes. So the question of how you uh, acknowledge and tell a story and in a sense, don't indict it. You can indict some of the tactics, certainly some of the consequences that occur because the loss of life is not something that any of us embrace at all. Uh, but um, the need and uh, understanding what is so difficult to break down in terms of some of the obstacles that have been created to become a more progressive and a more accepting society. You know, it's, it causes you to ask a lot of questions. And so the challenge was for us to make sure that the film was not answering something for you. It was telling you, you've got to, you've got to deal with this yourself in the sense of understanding how change takes place. Yeah. Well said, Buster. Well said. Yeah. I learned it I from want, you. <laughs> I want to, um, okay, I guess we can do a few more questions. So, I, I, but I also want to acknowledge that it, since it's six o'clock, some people may be getting off to go to some, see some other films. We're going to continue with a few more questions and this will be recorded for later. If you do have to leave, we hope that um, you're enjoying the festival and, and uh, you can also check the website for more. Um, Okay, so, um, so yeah, a few more questions. Um, one of the things, as they, uh, you have such great chemistry, and um, so the question is, will you work together again on a project? And that's yeah, from Lisa. 
<laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know what's going to come up. You know. Uh, I, Is I nothing know that, planned right now? I have something else, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. So. Mike and I are are. You guys Mike are always working together. We're, we're, we're doing a couple different films together right now. Yeah, so we have, I don't know, a dozen, uh, ten films behind us and a couple on the table now, and you never know how they're going to turn out. So stay tuned. Maybe next year. All right, wonderful. And what about Puerto Rico today with the current mm -hmm. administration and acknowledgement of the island? Um, you know, what? do you have any thoughts about, I know you, you did talk about the, um, you know, what happened after Hurricane Maria, um, and I'm just, Curious if you um, just with the current, I mean, even with COVID, the impact on Puerto Rico and you know other other things that have been happening of late. Any thoughts um, about what's happening now and and what you know what kind of resistance is happening now? Well, um, Juan lives there. J J July July of last year, which seems like a whole lifetime ago. Yeah. but it was really only July of last year, um, we forced, you know, the, the, gov the governor to resign. Now, how often do you see that? You know, if, if you look at U.S. jurisdictions, you know, or, or any place in the world, where do you see so many people get out on the street for a week or two every night and actually forcing the governor to resign? It's, that's huge. Now, then the thing is, how do you keep that transformative energy going and, and, and make it bear fruit? And this election is going to be very interesting because um, the official polls uh, give the, the third option. It's always been like a two-headed monster. Um, and the, the Independence Party by itself has always been a, a small percentage since the 1950s. In the 50s, it was 52% or uh, independence was 50% of the population was in favor. Now it's much less. But people looking for an option that is not either of these two parties that's corrupt and just uh, nepotism, incompetence, all of that stuff rolled into, well, you guys know what it's like. You're getting a taste. Um, so, <laughs> and they're acknowledging that the other ones, they're not going to have a majority, That, but they don't know whether this new option will have the biggest plurality. Some people are wishful thinking and saying, yeah, this is going to be the year where um, a third option wins and, and then we'll see what happens with how they go about creating a government. But so far, this uh, citizens' victory movement um, has been picking up off of Ju the July 2019, which was mobilized by cell phone and by, you know, internet. And that's how people, you know, called each other together. And a lot of these networks were, came into existence and continued after Maria, where people had to figure out how we were all going to survive until the government got its act together. And we were, people weren't going to wait. So there's a lot of this, and we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm kind of in a bubble, so I don't really know that much except for you know, um, Facebook posts that I see or this or that, but it's looking like it's going to be very interesting that they, they might, the, the two, neither of the two parties might win. And um, if they do, at least that third option is going to be strong enough that it'll definitely be the main challenger, if not the victor, for the next time around, which I think might be a good thing because I think um, they, we might not be ready. To, to run it. Uh, and, and if you do win, you, then you have to be able to make, make it run and make it work. Although, uh, since they're networks of networks and they have 
extremely competent people in all of the fields, and they've put up a program in, in each of the fields that have been cobbled together by all the people working on it. So it's, I'm very hopeful in, in the midst of this pandemic. I, I'm very hopeful. Can you name those three options? Well, you got the PNP, it's the New Progressive Party, which is the statehooders, which is basically the Republicans. Okay. And, then, and then you got the PPD, which is the Popular Democratic Party, which is historically the Luis Munoz Marine Party, the, the so-called Commonwealth. They're the ones that came up with that uh, figure. Um, and they've been trading back and forth since forever. And basically- Are they, are they the ones for independence? No, the, oh. no. The, the, these are both colonial parties. One is oh, okay. for statehood, the other one is just colo straight up colonialism. Oh. Um, and then the independence party is, has been um, very small in, okay. in terms of electoral, but in, in, in terms of its weight in the civil society, it's much greater because in all of the uh, unions and all of the uh, environmental movements and everything else are very active. And I think the, the fermentation of that is what's it's come out. Um, for example, um, Residente from Calle 13, who's been one of the big mobilizers of the movement. And just to give you a sense, there've been 113,000, I believe it is, uh, new voters uh, enrolled. That's huge, oh, wow. and, they're, and they're mostly very young. That's and, wonderful. And Rene, you know, he, he's won a bunch of Grammys, and he's he's visited with Evo Morales in Bolivia, and he's visited with uh, you know Jose Mujica, Pepe Mujica in mm -hmm. in, in Uruguay, and um, okay. and he, he's the son of independentistas. You know, his his father is a prominent independentista lawyer, and his mother is a you know independentista health worker, and you know the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and he has that great creative gift and he's mobilizing, mobilizing a lot of people. Bad Bunny is, has been mobilizing a lot of people. So uh, I think the traditional parties are scared. They see where did these 100,000 new voters come from? You know, we didn't sign them up. <laughs> What's going on here? And um, you know, we'll see. All right. All right. Well, we have to wrap it up. And sorry, um, I so, sorry. so I, so I want to, um, just tell you that one of the people, um, Deb, who's actually my sister, <laughs> wrote in to say she, um, that she deeply appreciates the gift of this film. It was incredibly powerful, informative, moving, and interesting. It definitely kept me involved for the whole time. Juan Segarra, you are inspirational. Thank you for your efforts for the independence of Puerto Rico. I appreciate knowing this part of your story. And other people also um, said that they learned a lot as well. So. Thanks so much to all of you, you. For, for this film and for joining us today. It's such a gift to have you all come on and, and talk with us. Um, so, um, so, if, so for, any, for everyone who's participating with the film, just want to say, uh, do you remember that there's still some films to watch? And then there's the closing that starts at 9 p.m. tonight. And so... Um, and then, of course, you can check things out on the website. There will not be a filmmaker hangout tonight since we're going late with the closing. So um, in, uh, enjoy the rest of the film festival. It's been a wonderful time. And, and again, thank you to all of you who have um, who made this wonderful film and shared it with us. Much to think about. Thank you for including us.